We are currently on Sunday mornings going through the Gospel of Luke. So if you have a Bible, would you join me in Luke chapter 11? That's where we left off and there's ushers coming down the aisles with Bibles. And uh, if you need one, want to borrow one, um, uh, phone service isn't that great in this room, at least not for my carrier. And so uh, you can just borrow a Bible if you want to uh, read it uh, book style. And we go verse by verse through the Bible on Sunday mornings. Um, just the next passage of scripture. And today we're up to Luke chapter 11, verse 27. And I intend to get through the end of the chapter um, today. Luke eleven twenty-seven. Uh, if I was to ask you uh, a series of questions, how, just how would you uh, respond to those? Like, for example, how do you get out of overwhelming sadness? Um, how would you counsel someone to avoid ruining their life? How do you uh, avoid getting caught up in a cult? Or, or maybe something more positive. How do you have a victorious Christian life? And, you know, there's various ways that you could answer those questions. They always kind of, most of them kind of point back to the same thing, what the Lord has, is doing and has done. But a common answer, and, and the title of my message today might be, uh, let in the light of God. That's why I called this section, because I believe that's what Jesus emphasizes in this section, that we would let in um, the light of God. And this is a, uh, a, a common theme that comes up in the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament. For example, I, I ran across the Apostle Paul talking about light in our life in Ephesians chapter 5, where he said, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, speak, speak, speaking of Christians. He says, so walk as children of the light. And so that's what we're supposed to do with our life. Walk like we are in the light uh, of God. So I would ask you, is that your desire? Is that who you want to be? You know, maybe you're here today because you've been stumbling around in darkness and you're sick of it. I mean, that happened to me in my life at one point. And if that's you, I'm glad you're here. Or you're already in the light of God and you want to avoid some of the traps that other people fall into. And that's why you want more of the word uh, in you. Or just simply you want to enjoy your life with God more. Well, whatever the case is, I'm glad you're here because today Jesus is going to explain why more of the light in our life is better. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you several lessons in our text today, five of them as we go through this, where Jesus is going to show us that one thing is better than another, and we should desire the one thing <laughs> instead of the other. And I'll show you why uh, it's better. He wants us to embrace the Lord's way. And so an easy way to sort of capture this is to say, let in the light of God. So all that said is an introduction um, we'll get into the, the, the scriptures. Oh, one last thing. Um, uh, Jesus, uh, this is kind of like a spoiler alert, <laughs> because he is going to be very rough on the Pharisees and the scribes <laughs> and the, the lawyers in that day. And it's, you know, if you're not familiar with the Bible, maybe you've never even heard someone teach the Bible, just know that Jesus doesn't always speak this way to people, but he does when it's needed. And I'm not going to explain it away. I'm just letting you know, it's fair warning here that this is, this is a, a, a very pointed and difficult passage to go through and to hear sometimes. But the seriousness of it is important for the church and for unbelievers to hear. Okay, so let's start here in verse 27. And this is what Luke said. And it happened as Jesus spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Okay, I'm going to stop here for a few moments. And just as a you know, to catch us up to speed, you know, the last time 
um, we were together, the previous part of chapter 11, we looked at the importance of the believer's prayer life. Do you guys remember that? Where it, it, it's so important for us to pray in faith that we would, we would pray uh, persistently with uh, the Lord. We would pray in the spirit. And there's this huge crowd that's been around Jesus this whole time listening to him preach uh, about these kingdom uh, things. When all of a sudden, what we just read there, a woman shouts out, blessed is your mom. <laughs> and Jesus never seems to just let someone's opinion about things just kind of hang out there, you know? So he corrects her. Did you see that in verse 28? Now, she's actually right, isn't she? I mean, his mother, Mary, is blessed, right? We know she's, she's blessed. She said she was blessed in the scriptures, singing her song. And, and, uh, and we know from the scriptures that she's blessed because she's the mother of Jesus. <laughs> she's the mother of the Messiah, the Savior, the Savior of mankind. Of course she's, she's blessed. So if that's the case, then why does he call her out in public like that? Well, I think it's because she's unknowingly putting the attention on Mary instead of on Jesus. He isn't saying that she's not blessed. She is. Just that the more blessed, the truly blessed, you could say, people are those, as he said, that hear God's word and keep it. Do something with it, right? We receive it by faith, and then we go and do something with it, right? And so this is really, it should be fascinating to all of us to hear or to read this, what, what, what he said, because she's trying to congratulate his mother, but Jesus, so wise, he takes the focus off of one person and puts it on everyone who can be in his family. You see, the, 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 the blessing isn't exclusive. It's for anyone who will hear and do something um, with it. And so all are blessed who do that. So remember I said there's going to be five lessons in our study. Here's one if you're taking uh, notes. We'll put them on the screens for you um, in the outline. The first blessing, uh, or should, the first lesson is relationship with God by faith is better than any other relationship. <laughs> there's lots of good relationships, right? Just like the one that was pointed out here. Mother and son. It's a blessing. But the relationship with God is supreme, and it's the best. And that's the one we should seek first. Okay, well, let's continue. Verses 29 and 30, it says, And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. See, I told you he was going to start talking about stuff. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah, the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. When he says Son of Man, he's speaking of himself. The, the, the Gospel of Luke, uh, I, we, you know, we call it, uh, my, my theme for the Gospel of Luke is the perfect Son of Man. And he talks about himself in that way uh, quite a bit. So that's a reference to, to himself. And, he, and he's, he's concerned because these people are seeking after a sign. And it's not the first time it's come up. If you just go back to verse 16 that we covered last time, we're told that many of the people that were hanging around were there just to see a sign from heaven. You know, like a really big miracle. Because Jesus did miracles at times. But he did them for a purpose. You know, they had a purpose of pointing people to God. But some people just want to see the miracle. You know, they want to see the show. And, and, if you, and if that's who you are, it's never enough. It's like, you know, it's like when, you, when, 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 um, when your relationship with God is all about the experience. Some people struggle with this because, you know, if, you're, if your relationship with God is all about like how you feel and the experience, it's, you're always going to be looking for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And it never will be uh, enough. And that's how we're seeing here with these folks following them around. And they want a miracle. And so Jesus, did you see there in verse 29, he calls it an evil generation. 
You could probably say that about all generations, couldn't you? Certainly ours. I mean, ours has to be in the top 10 of the evil generations, doesn't it? I mean, just look around what's going on. But he particularly calls this one evil because, because it seeks after a sign. Right? All the, 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 the people of Israel he's talking about there, they want to see something from God before they will believe. Some kind of an experience. And so what he does is he compares himself to Jonah. Did you see that? Now, um, you might be familiar with the story of Jonah. It's, it's pretty a well-known one. But if you're not, Jonah was an Old Testament prophet who was sent by God to a city called Nineveh to save those people from destruction. They were sinning against God, and God loved them. The Assyrians, even though they were awful people, God loves people even when they're awful. And he sent Jonah to rescue them and to preach about God's coming judgment um, to them. But Jonah, as many of you know, was a resistant prophet because he hated the Assyrians. The Jewish people hated the Assyrians. And so instead of going to Nineveh, he went the other direction. And so the Lord wasn't having that, and he sent a, a, a fish. Well, first of all, he got tossed overboard of the boat that he was on, and then the Lord had him swallowed, and, and Jonah spent the long, a nice long weekend inside of a big fish. And he had some time to think about this, and, 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 and he turned his heart, and the fish eventually brought him to land and spit him out, and, and he went to preach there. So Jesus is connecting him to Jonah, not that Jesus is resistant like Jonah, but that in the sense Jonah is in the grave, in the fish, right? Under the water, in the grave, so to speak. But then he's returned to land, the land uh, of the living, and then he went and preached to the Ninevites, and they believed, all of them. So Jesus then says, as Jonah, uh, as Jonah um, became a sign to the Ninevites, I am a sign to this generation. Because Jesus will be resurrected from the dead. He will spend three days and three nights in the tomb like Jonah spent in that fish. And then he will, you know, he's preaching to the, to the lost to be saved. And, and he's basically saying, look, this is the only sign that you need. My resurrection. Now he gives a couple of examples next um, why uh, they don't need signs, any more signs. Look, he says in verse 31, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. Okay, she's talking about, or he, I'm sorry, is talking about the queen of Sheba. And uh, the Queen of Sheba in the Old Testament traveled far, hundreds of miles, to visit Solomon, King Solomon. She had heard about the glorious things that God was doing in Israel. And so uh, she wanted to see for herself. And so she spared no expense, even though she's a Gentile. And, and she went. And she didn't see any miracles. All she saw was the wisdom of Solomon, the, the glory of God's kingdom, the worship and, you know, the things that Solomon knew and, and, uh, and she believed, the Bible tells us. And so Jesus is saying, she, that queen, is going to rise up in the judgment and bear witness against this evil generation. Right? And I was reminded when I was reading this that there's this old saying. Have you guys ever heard this old saying that goes, the same sun that melts ice hardens clay? Have you guys heard that saying before? Well, so it is with the light of God, the truth of God, which is what we're talking about here today. It either melts the hearts of stone like the Queen of Sheba, or it hardens others like these people seeking a sign. And the ones we'll see later on in our text, it, it hardens them. And the light, the truth, the glory of God can do both to people. 
Well, that's one example. Verse 32 is another example, and he talks about, he says, the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment in this generation, with this generation, and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Okay, again, he's pointing to these Old Testament saints that believed the Ninevites, and they bear witness of the unbelief that these current generation has. And it's because here is the Son of God standing in front of them. And they're not listening. All they want is a sign. And you know what, you guys? The same thing is going on today. I mean, think about it. There's a a church everywhere you look. And most of them, a bunch of them, you can go in and hear the gospel. You can hear the Bible being taught. You can learn about God. There's Christians all over the world sharing their faith. Now we have social media. The gospel is readily available everywhere. But some people just don't want to hear it. And Jesus says very plainly that they're going to be judged. They're going to have to stand before Almighty God and explain it. Lesson number two that we come to in our outline is belief in God's word is better than a sign. Belief in God's word is better than a sign. You see, Jesus, in, I would say, is trying to get them and us now to, to, to take the Lord at his word and not just focus on some kind of miracle happening before we will, like, get in line here. And again, this is something that isn't just taught here. It comes up elsewhere in Scripture. As a matter of fact, when we get into, uh, in a few weeks, into Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells about a man, he calls him the rich man, who died apart from the Lord. And um, he, he talks about this man while he's in torment in a place called Hades, which is a, uh, a holding place that's awful awaiting the judgment of God. It's where the Old Testament saints, it's where everybody goes that dies today, awaiting the judgment of God if they're not in Christ. And so this, this, this man in torment, it says that Jesus said that he was begging Abraham. Somehow he had Abraham's ear. And he was begging Abraham to send someone to warn his brothers about this torment, about the judgment that was coming. And Abraham said this, they have the law and the prophets. Let them listen to that. And the man said, but, but, but if somebody would come back from the dead and tell them, then they will listen. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to God's word, they're not going to be persuaded even if someone will rise from the dead. In other words, people who demand a miracle People who demand a sign can't be convinced with those things. They have the word. And that's why I said here, belief in God's word is better than a sign. So Jesus, very pointed, saying, there's Jonah, there's Solomon, but a greater than Jonah, a greater than Solomon is here. It's me, the son of man. Now, the next section we're going to look at here, I think, is the key to our whole study today. So hopefully we can just kind of like uh, zoom in on this together. Let's look at verses 33 to 36. And Jesus said this, Now, no one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Okay, well, I'm going to try and simplify this down because it sounds a little confusing when you first run through that. 
Basically, God sends his light into the world so that we can turn to the light. Jesus talks about this at length in John chapter 3. If you get a chance, you might want to go and read that uh, later. Uh, one of the Jewish leaders approached Jesus asking questions about eternal life and how to get it. And Jesus starts talking about the light. He actually said that light came into the world to save us all because we were all headed for destruction. And then Jesus went on to say later on in that chapter that some go to the light and others don't. And, you know, one thing that I try to remember is that if someone won't go to the light, it's not God's fault. It's there, right? And it's been shown to the world. Jesus is for the world. And yet, if I won't go to the light, then the Bible says that I will be condemned because I'm already condemned in my sins. I need Jesus to forgive me of my sins. So that's the John 3 in a, in a nutshell. And, and so the Lord provides this light, shines it in the world for people to go to. And then the question is, what do we do with that? I, one of my favorite songs is by a band called Citizens. And the song is called, uh, it's titled Psalm 18. And um, I just wanted to read the first few lines of the song for you because I, I love the way it starts. And the singer goes like this. He says, burdened by death, desperate for life. You found me in darkness and put me in your light. You gave me a song and I'll shout it for joy because the curse has been lifted and you've won the war. And then he goes and starts singing hallelujah. <laughs> and it's just an awesome message because he's talking about the light that God has sent into the world for you and for you and for you and for me. And it's intended to be seen. That's what he was just talking about there in those verses that we read. The light is intended to be seen. It's intended to shine on us. And it's intended that we would let it in. And as a matter of fact, based on what I just read, he wants a lot of light in our life. So lesson number three that we come to now is lots of light is better than any darkness. <laughs> lots of light in your life, friend, is better than any darkness. Because look back at verse 33 with me. Notice that it's possible for light to be darkness. And you're like, wait, what? How can that be? Well, he said so when it's put out of sight, when it's hidden. You know, picture a lamp in your bedroom and you throw a, a blanket over it. Would you see much of that light? No. Someone, you know, I think the first audience that Jesus is after is those who are blind and need salvation, that they need the light to come into their life for the first time. And I pray that if that's you, that you would consider that, that you wouldn't reject the light, that you would ask God to forgive you of your sins. I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end of this service to receive Christ as your Savior. And I think that's the first audience that he's talking to here. But also, when you read verse 33, it seems like he He's also talking about somebody who has the light of Jesus in their life, but they kind of put it in the basement, you know? And then now the rest of the house is kind of dark, and it's not really a guide to us anymore because it's just sort of this thing off to the side. My faith is over there, and now I'm doing all this over here, you know? Have you ever done stuff like that? Donald Gray Barnhouse uh, said that, um, it's because many people read the Bible like a tourist. He said they just rush through it quickly like a tourist, just glancing at this and that, and they don't really like receive the light into their life. <laughs> when really, God gives us his word to reveal himself to us and help us with all these things that are so needful for us in our life. <laughs> And you know, the trouble here is that if a believer keeps letting in darkness, soon they won't be able to tell the difference between the light and the dark. So when I read this, you know what I did? I started to examine myself. Not that like God's going to strip me of my salvation, but that 
I want the gospel, the gospel should be bringing about an inner change in our life, shouldn't it? And if it's not, like, we need to deal with that. I want light in my life. I hope you do, too. So beware of the darkness. Beware of any darkness in your life. Verse 37, it says, And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. Okay, this is going to get really good now. <laughs> Jesus always seems to accept dinner invitations. <laughs> Doesn't matter who it is. <laughs> Even a, from a Pharisee, you know. Um, Pharisees, uh, as many of you know, were, were some of the religious leaders uh, in Israel at the time. Basically, they made sure that everybody kept the law. <laughs> That was their role, you could say. But really, what it was, was they were enforcing their own traditions. A lot of it was that. Like this one. You know, uh, he's it's talking about ceremonial washing here. Because the, the law, the Old Testament law said that the priests were supposed to wash up before they served God in the temple. Um, you know, before they offered sacrifices and, and those kind of things, that God provide a wash basin for them to do that at the, at the tabernacle and at, at, at the temple. But what the rulers of Israel started to do was take it further than it was ever intended. And then, and then it gets to this, where they're just so concerned about swallowing something that might defile them, you know, like some little bit on their hand, maybe a little bug or something. And, and, um, and so they were very strict about the way that they, they washed before they would eat. They would, you know, take the water and, and they had this very particular way that they would wash their hands so that they would, would run off of them and, and they would not be um, defiled. And if you didn't do that, you would be excommunicated as a leader. So here's Jesus <laughs> and he doesn't do that. And he's a rabbi and this guy's watching him going, how can this guy not observe our traditions? Which, by the way, is what happens with legalists. They take a few simple things that God has given us to observe, and then they start putting all kinds of restrictions on top of that, right? On top of themselves, and on top of you, and anybody else that will listen. For instance, here, here's an example I could give you. It's just one that came to mind. I've actually never seen this, but this could happen. Um, let's say someone uh, struggled a lot with gambling before they were saved. Okay? So you can imagine someone who's just consumed with, with gambling. And so they get saved, and now this person has a conviction that they need to stay away from, say, playing cards. Right? Like, it's just too much of a temptation. I was destroying myself. And one of the things was all this gambling, you know. So I'm just going to, you know, the Lord urges that person to avoid it, right? And for a while, it goes well. But then, you know, they start to see other people playing cards. And then they start to blog on the internet about how all card playing is of the devil. And, and, and you... Since you're doing that, are not really a true believer because you play card games, right? And we're kind of snickering right now, but this is what happens if we're not careful. If we don't let the light of God in and see it for what it is, you become a Pharisee. And so this is what the Pharisees are doing. And Jesus knows all of this about him, of course. He knows what he's thinking. And so look what happens in verse 39. It says, Then the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones. Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? Okay, so Jesus reminds us that you can look all spiritual, but be really far from God. And it's easier to fool people because we can only see the outward, right? 
Jesus, I'm sorry, the Lord sees the heart. And so, well, that would include Jesus, of course. God sees the heart. You see, these guys, they thought that as long as they appeared holy, that they could do whatever they wanted to. But he points out that the problem is not the external. The problem is an internal one that they're having. And he continues in verse 41 and 42 with it, and he says, but rather give alms of such things as you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Okay, I warned you ahead of time. Jesus is pronouncing woes now upon these Pharisees. Three of them that we're going to look at. And these are things you could say are things that Jesus, who's the judge, in the last days, he will be the judge. He's keeping track of these things for the judgment day. And so these are woes that are put on the Pharisees. And the first one here that we read about is that they're trying to buy God off <laughs> with what they do. Trying to earn God's favor. And so what they would do is they would give a tenth or a tithe of all the stuff they grew in their garden, for example. The herbs and, and, and whatnot. And they were very careful to do this down to the leaf. <laughs> you know, the penny. But Jesus told us there, they were omitting the bigger things. Grace, and mercy, and love of God. And, and so he pointed out there that you need to do both. Yes, you ought to give. But you have to have the love of God first. You see, the problem was they were only doing the secondary thing. They ignored the primary thing. And so lesson number four in our outline uh, here is that loving God is better than being a Pharisee. Loving God is better than being a Pharisee. You see, the problem wasn't really what they were doing as much as what they were not doing. And they weren't loving God. They were just trying to keep rules. And so Jesus is saying, love God first, then the giving will follow, right? And that's like, I mean, we talk about this all the time here, don't we? You know, we've got to keep things in order here. It's about our relationship with God first. We love him because he first loved us. It's on the front of our website. <laughs> we have to keep that in mind at all times. He's the initiator. We are the responder. <laughs> love God is better than being a Pharisee, trying to earn it, making rules. There's another woe, verse 43 says, Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Um, the second woe here is connected to the fact that they just uh, love to be noticed. And again, this is a, a big problem in religion. And, you know, picture a synagogue, you know, a, a small gathering place of, uh, of Jewish people. And the... Uh, the, the Pharisees would sit up in front facing the congregation. And, and so they were, it's like a place of honor for them, but they love that. They love to be admired and, and given special treatment and, and, and to be known out on the street. Oh, Rabbi, you're so awesome. And, you know, those, those kind of things. And Jesus knows their heart. And, and you know, the problem with with people who, who like to be seen as spiritual, even though they're not spiritual. And so it's a big problem that he has um, with them. And anybody like that? Woe to you, verse 44, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like graves which are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. Um, again, it's helpful to know the Old Testament law when you read these kind of things because the Jews were considered unclean if they came into contact with a dead person. 
And so then they would have to go through a ritual ceremonial cleansing period to be rid of that uncleanness. Even if it was just walking over a grave, it's still, it's still applied. And so that's what Jesus is, is saying here. That's the same idea with the Pharisees. The third woe is he's saying the people, the Jewish people don't know that you Pharisees are spiritually dead, but you're defiling them by coming into contact with them. You see what's happening here? So he's really calling, and they would know exactly what he's talking about. Like, this is really serious, this matter. Well, look at the verse 45. It says, then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. And Jesus said, woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. <laughs> I was thinking, man, that dude should have kept his mouth shut. <laughs> like, oh gosh, don't speak up. <laughs> So Jesus turns to him and says, woe to you lawyers now too. The lawyers were different than, you know, the lawyers today. These guys were experts at interpreting God's Old Testament law. And they spent all their time doing that. However, Jesus is pointing out the fact that they were only good at telling others what to do. They couldn't keep the law. And so they were loading it on to other people. He's like, you guys have figured out how to avoid the law because you know you can't keep it. And so you're just burdening down everybody else. And he can speak from authority here because he doesn't do that. Jesus is just the opposite. He takes the burdens from us. Bible actually says that he, he, Jesus says, come to me, all you are, who are, who are heavy, um, who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Lesson number five, this is the last one I'll do with you here today. Number five is being like Jesus is better than laying heavy burdens on others. Being like Jesus is better because his yoke is easy. His burden is light. And you and I, my friend, that know Christ, we are his ambassadors. And so we're not supposed to be like piling stuff on people that's too hard for, for us to carry and then expecting other people to do it. And it's because we're just like the lawyers. Be like Jesus instead. Help people with the burden that they're carrying. Well, he's not done with the lawyers. Verse 47 and 48, he says, Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers. For they indeed killed them and you build their tombs. The prophets were killed because the people wanted to keep right on sinning. You know, the Lord sent Old Testament prophets, people like John the Baptist, Isaiah, Jeremiah, to warn the children of Israel, and they didn't want to hear it. So they would kill him, you know, put him in jail. And it's, 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 it's weird, but for some strange reason, sinners think that if they can shut up the saints, that the problem goes away. <laughs> Except it doesn't. But, but, but it's a strange thing, and I've probably said this before. It's just, it's a head-scratcher to me. <laughs> just get rid of that person, and I'm off the hook. No, because it's God who sent them, <laughs> right? Therefore, he says in verse 49, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. In other words, they killed them from A to Z. Right? Abel to Zechariah. Abel 
uh, if you remember in the book of Genesis, he was the first witness of God that was killed. Right? He was murdered by his brother Cain. Brother Cain didn't want to hear it. He didn't like who Abel was and what he represented and the righteousness uh, of God. Killed him. First murder. Zacharias was, or Zechariah was a, was a prophet who was trying to reform Israel at the time of King Joash. And he was put to death for speaking the truth. And so Jesus points out these two guys as examples. You know, the bookends, A to Z, that they were doing this. Your generation, your fathers, the, you know, these people that you admire, the ones who came before you so much, they were doing it just like you're doing it. But note the last phrase there in verse 51. Would you go back there with me? He said, it shall, all this stuff shall be required of this generation. In other words, it doesn't just go away. <laughs> Even if, if they put him to death, those prophets, the apostles, it doesn't go away. There's justice coming. The Lord is keeping track of all these things. And their punishment with God will be severe. But there's an escape. There always is. Well, there's one more woe, verse 52. He said, woe to you lawyers. For you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves. And those who were entering in, you hindered. And this is, might be the biggest crime of all. Not only do they do it to themselves, but they prevent others from believing. Wow. I've always often wondered, like, why do you care? You know, I see real militant atheists on social media, and I'm like, why do you care? Why do you care what other people believe? But they do. These guys were burying the truth of God under a mountain of man-made rules and making it difficult for others to come into God's kingdom. And you know, just for us today, and I know this is like, it's, it's hard to sit and listen to all this. And, but if you're in the body of Christ, you need to be worried. He's not talking to you because you're not doing this. But there is something that we can apply to ourselves and, and we can all take away as a little learning uh, uh, tool. And that's that it's important for all of us to have a sensitivity towards placing unnecessary rules on people. Because it's kind of part of the human nature. Our human nature wants to earn our favor with God. And we think that being more rules-oriented and keeping you know, things, um, you know, proves that I am a spiritual person. And, and, and then we, we, we sort of project that onto others. But Jesus just said that it can hinder them. <laughs> Unnecessary. You know, I think about my kids and, and the people that I'm in the ministry, our staff, our pastors and elders, and, and you guys, like, like, I'm trying to figure out ways to get rules out of our church. <laughs> Unnecessary rules. I know there needs to be order, and, and there are things that God has given us as principles to live by. And, but man, we should be careful with putting heavy yoke of burdens on people when God isn't like that. He doesn't want to do that. He wants us to have liberty and freedom in the Lord. Well, do they get the message? You think these guys get the message and have a heart change? Well, can I get the worship team to come back up to sing a last song? And we'll just read this as we, as we close, okay? Here's what happens. Verse 53. It says, And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and, and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. Wow. So the answer is no. They didn't get it, right? You know, some people just don't want to hear from Jesus. They don't, 
they just want to try and trap him and prove him wrong. All you have to do is be on social media a little bit and you see that, you know, folks are trying to figure out how can I get out of this Jesus thing and the truth. And some people just get angry like them, you know. They're mad at God. They're mad at the preacher or whatever uh, it is. I pray that that would be none of us. Maybe you're sitting here, you're hearing all this for the first time. And you're like, I don't want to face God in judgment. Well, good, because you don't have to. But you have to turn to the Lord by faith. God sent his only son, Jesus, to die on a horrible Roman cross to take your sins and my sins upon himself. Everything that we've, uh, every evil deed, every evil thought, every um, 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 just sideways bad comment about someone, all those things nailed to the cross on your behalf. But we have to put our trust in the one who came to take those sins from us. And I pray that you would do that. If you haven't done it yet, that you would do it right now. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Receive it today for yourself. Well, this is a tough section to cover. <laughs> and I'm kind of glad it's over. But it's the truth. It's good. Jesus is none too happy with these guys. And you know why? Because they're ripping off people. They're bad attitudes. They don't carry the Lord's uh, message of faith and freedom. But he showed us better ways, didn't he? I pointed them out, and you know, a big way is to let the light of God in. Let the Holy Spirit guide you, get the word in your life. <laughs> Prayer, seek God with your life, and let the light of God, um, you know, push out all darkness so we can be effective in our own life and be an example to others. Would you guys uh, stand with me? Let's pray together. I just want to pray with you. Um, if you want to receive Christ for yourself, you want to ask him, you might pray with me something like this. Lord, um, please forgive me of my sins. Thank you for sending your son Jesus for me. I don't want to be judged. I want to go to heaven. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for, for, for speaking it plain. And, and thank you for taking uh, the burden of sin upon yourself for my behalf. And Lord, I also pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ here today and, and that we would not be condemned. You said there's no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. But Lord, we would leave here and walk in the spirit and, and we would have no darkness in our life and we would be a light to the world. Thank you, God, for the truth of your word and the blessing that it is in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.